Hey everyone, and welcome to another video here at Whiteboard Doctor. Thanks for joining us today. Quick disclaimer before we move on, none of these videos are intended to be acted upon as medical advice. Please pause the video here and read the disclaimer in its entirety before moving on. Channel plug, here at Whiteboard Doctor, our mission is to bring you interesting, relevant, and understandable medical education for all types of lifelong learners, trainees, and practitioners. If you want to follow along, we do have a lovely subscribe button in the bottom right-hand corner of all the videos. Don't forget to hit that like button. And lastly, if you'd like to support us outside of viewing our videos, we have several ways in which you can do that linked in the video description and pinned comment. Stay well, keep learning, and back to the video. Hey everybody and welcome back to another video. Today we're going to be doing a video that is more tailored towards you know healthcare trainees or practitioners or professionals um, rather than the the general public although we always encourage everybody who's curious to you know watch the videos and check them out but um, we're going to be doing kind of introduction to the arterial blood gas or understanding the ABG we're going to come out with a series of acid base videos in terms of understanding acid base and this is kind of the start of that so this will be a quicker video just kind of on the foundational topics on sampling calculating, you know, what they're good for, what they're used for, all that kind of stuff. So to start this video, understanding the ABG is critical for all nurses, respiratory therapists, advanced practice providers, docs, and more, right? The ABG is a critical component of the evaluation of many different types of patients and can provide lots of great information. What is a blood gas? Well, you're able to do a blood gas on pretty much any uh, place where there is blood. Um, this is typically the veins, venous, the arteries, arterial, or the capillaries, which are between the arteries and the veins. And you can do a sample blood gas, right? You're getting blood and you're checking the gases in that blood on any of these areas. In this video, we're talking about arterial blood gases, but just for kind of further understanding, we drew here kind of an artery in the red going into a capillary in the purple and a vein in the blue. And you can sample, you know, an arterial blood gas from the artery, a capillary gas from the capillary, or a venous gas from the vein. So, you know, this would be arterial blood gas, ABG, capillary blood gas, CBG, or venous blood gas, VBG. And you do these blood gases to look at things like carbon dioxide or CO2, oxygen or O2, and then the acid base status or pH. And this can give you a lot of information about how well the patient's breathing and how well their kidneys are working and so on and so forth. Just a little intro to how gases work in the blood vessels. This is a red blood cell in the artery carrying oxygenated blood. So you have oxygen on the red blood cell. You also have oxygen floating around in the blood, which is the partial pressure of oxygen, and carbon dioxide floating around in the blood. It goes through the capillary where oxygen goes out into the tissues. Carbon dioxide comes from the tissues into the blood, and then it goes into the vein to be delivered back to the lungs. And there's less oxygen in the red blood cells, less oxygen floating around in the venous blood, and then more carbon dioxide. All right, so sampling. How do we sample? How do we get an ABG? Well, you can actually sample any artery theoretically, but most often the arteries you're sampling are the radial artery, which runs in the wrist, or the femoral artery, which runs in the groin. Far and away, the radial artery is the artery kind of of choice. So how do you do it? Well, you start with something called the Allen's test, and the Allen's test is to assess for adequate circulatory flow, uh, not circulatory, collateral flow through the wrist. And what we mean by that is the wrist actually has, um, and specifically the hand has, two different arterial blood sources. All right, one is the radial artery, which runs kind of towards and along the thumb. All right, and we'll put an R here for radial. The other one is actually the ulnar artery, um, which runs near the pinky. And we'll put a U here for ulnar. And both of these perfuse the hand with kind of branches of arteries that come out. So the Allen's test is essentially you raise the arm above your head, clench the hand in a fist, and press down. You occlude both of these arteries, so you press down on both of them. The hand should kind of get to be a pale color. You'll then unclench the fist and only release the pressure off the ulnar artery while keeping pressure on the radial artery. And what you want is for the hand to pink up again. 
and that suggests that you're getting enough blood flow, flow through the ulnar artery to keep the hand well perfused um, with enough blood. And that means if you were to, you know, injure the radial artery, that the hand would still get enough blood flow. If the hand doesn't pink up, it means that the ulnar artery isn't giving the hand enough blood flow, and then that's very high risk, because if you were to damage the radial artery during the ABG draw, there would not be enough blood flow to the hand, and you could have ischemia or lack of blood flow to that hand. So start with the Allen's test to gauge for collateral flow through the ulnar artery. You'll then palpate the radial pulse in the wrist right around this region, remember, by the thumb there. All right. Once you have a good radial pulse, and we're not going to go through the details of exactly how to do the poke, we can. Let us know in the comments if you want us to make that video. You um, poke with a blood gas syringe, which is a certain type of syringe, that artery. And you're always poking in this direction towards the body. All right. You had success. You did a good poke. You got the ABG. You run that blood sample at a blood gas lab. This is separate from the main lab, typically, because um, you use a blood gas machine, and it's rapid results all right, in 5 to 15 minutes. In fact, sometimes you can do something like a hemoglobin or a blood count or like stat electrolytes off of blood gas. It's not as accurate as if you were to do kind of the serum electrolytes, but it comes back a lot faster, 5 to 15 minutes um, in that machine. So it's a stat rapid blood gas test. So once you get it back, what does it tell you and how do you interpret it? So there's a few things that are measured, right, that, that measures, and then there's a few things that are actually derived or calculated from the sample. The pH is measured, and that's the acid-base status of the blood. Um, and the normal values for that are 7.35 to 7.45. We kind of use 7.4 as a general normal. It also measures the PaO2. This is the partial pressure of oxygen in the blood vessel, and that's 75 to 100 millimeters of mercury. So the partial pressure, the PaO2, is how much of this oxygen is floating around in the blood. It's not the oxygen saturation on the red blood cells, it's how much oxygen is floating around in the blood. All right? It also measures the PaCO2, or the partial pressure of carbon dioxide, which is 35 to 45, which we often use 40 as kind of a normal uh, millimeters of mercury. And again, that is the partial pressure, so it's the amount of free carbon dioxide floating around in the blood. A few things that are calculated, so these are kind of derived from the ABG blood gas. You know, they're not free measurements, meaning there can be some air. The bicarbonate levels are calculated, and that's 22 to 26. We often use kind of 24 as the generic normal. Base access or deficit, that's how much extra acid or base is in the blood, and that's minus 4 to plus 2. And then the SAO2, or the amount of arterial oxygen saturation, that is how much oxygen is actually on the red blood cells themselves, how much oxygen is saturating those red blood cells. All right, and they put the normal in a lot of references as 95 to 100%, although, you know, people with COPD and stuff, kind of greater than 88% can be considered normal. And this should correlate with the oxygen saturation that you see on the actual monitor. All right, so these are all calculated values, whereas these are measured values. So these are the much more important values that we look at because they're directly measured from the blood gas. All right, and the last part of this video is going to be an introduction to calculating acid-base status. So there's a lot to this, and we're actually going to come out with an acid-base series of videos, um, identifying compensated versus uncompensated mixed metabolic respiratory combinations of, you know, anion gap metabolic acidosis versus non-anion gap metabolic acidosis, um, but we're not going to focus on any of these in this. We're just going to do the um, introductory kind of simple identifying an acidosis versus alkalosis and knowing whether it's primary metabolic or primary respiratory. And to do this, we drew out just kind of a little hierarchy here. So first you look at the pH, all right? If the pH is between 7.35 and 7.45, um, that is a normal pH. You're not acidemic or alkalemic. All right. If it is not, you can use kind of the generic 7.4. So if it is a less than 7.4, you are acidotic. And then you need to look at one other thing, either the PCO2 or the bicarb. And for this, we chose the PCO2. So if your pH is less than 7.40 and your PCO2 is less than 40, that's a primary metabolic acidosis. If your pH is less than 7.4 and your PCO2 is greater than 40, that's a primary respiratory acidosis. 
Contrarily, if your pH is greater than 7.4, that's an alkalosis. Again, then you look at your PCO2. If your PCO2 is less than 40, that is a respiratory alkalosis. If your PCO2 is more than 40, that's a metabolic alkalosis. So just some examples, you know, let's say our pH is 7.20, our PCO2 is 90, and our bicarb, again, for the sake of this, will be, you know, we'll just say it's 28, all right? We aren't even looking at bicarb right now, but what we look at would be your pH, right? So 7.40, 7.20, .20, it's less than. So it's an acidosis. So A for acidosis. Then we look at our PCO2. It's less than 40 or more than 40? It's more than 40. So it is a respiratory acidosis. All right, this would be like a COPD exacerbation. Contrarily, let's say, you know, your pH is 7.50 and your PCO2 is 70 and your bicarb in this instance will be I don't choose anything, 19. Again, we're not looking at bicarb to determine these. Um, your pH is more than 7.4, it's 7.50. Your PCO2 is more than 40, so it's a primary metabolic alkalosis, right? So it is an alkalosis, and it is metabolic. All right, does that make sense? We're going to go into this in much, much more detail in future videos, so subscribe and follow along if you're interested. We just wanted to kind of do an introduction to metabolic versus respiratory acidosis versus alkalosis. So for these examples, we used the PCO2 as the second marker we looked at after the pH. But you can replace this with the bicarb if you wanted to. So we essentially have the same little chart over here. And instead of the PCO2 here, we'll write bicarb, HCO3, H. CO3. And normal for this we'll say is 24, right? So if you are acidotic, your pH is less than 7.40, and your bicarb is low, bicarb is a base, right? So if your bicarb is low, that means that your acidosis is metabolic because your base is low, right? Whereas your bicarb is high with an acidosis, that means that it is respiratory. So it's the opposite of when we looked at the PCO2. Same thing here, so you're alkalotic. So if your bicarb is high, bicarb's a base. So if your pH is high or basic and you're alkalotic, it's going to be metabolic in origin. And contrarily, if you have an alkalosis and your bicarb is low, that would mean that you, you know, are maybe compensating and it's respiratory in origin. All right, respiratory. So the things to think about here, whether you look at bicarb, you know, in this area, or whether you look at PCO2, the things to think about are what does this bicarb or PCO2 being low or high mean? So bicarb being a base, right, we'll say that's a base. So if the bicarb is low when you have less base and you're acidotic, that's metabolic because your low bicarb is causing that, right? As you can see here. Whereas if your pH is low and you're acidotic, but your bicarb is high, that is conflicting with the pH, right? Because if you have more base, more bicarb, you would expect the pH to be high and basic. So that would mean that what your bicarb is doing is it is compensating for a respiratory acidosis. All right? And we don't want to leave you on a cliffhanger, but we're going to talk a lot about compensation coming up in future videos. So we'll probably leave this, this there. All right. But we, I guess here, we can do a few more examples, just, um, these examples over here, but using bicarb rather than, um, uh, PCO2. So just like we did over there, let's say the pH is 7.20, right? That is less than 7.4. So you have an acidosis. And your PCO2, which we're going to ignore in this case, is 70, and your bicarb is, let's call it, actually, let's do this different. The PCO2 is going to be 50, and your bicarb is 14. So if we go down here, pH is 7.40, 7.2 less than acidosis, all right? bicarb of 24, 14 is less than. So this is a metabolic acidosis because the amount of bicarb or the amount of base is low, meaning the low bicarb is causing the acidosis. Whereas if your pH is 7.20, 
your PCO2 is 70, and your bicarb is, let's call it um, 30, you still go down the same chart, right? pH 7.40, 7.2 is less than, so it's an acidosis. Your bicarb is 30, so it's more than 24, so it's respiratory, because the amount of base is high, but the pH is still low, meaning your bicarb is compensating for primary respiratory acidosis. And again, we'll get into that more. So you can just follow these charts, but you just need to choose one, bicarb or PCO2, and then you just follow acidosis, alkalosis, high, low. All right, and then when we get into compensation, maybe we'll go back to the tic-tac-toe diagram or some of those other things. Let us know. Um, all right, let us know what thoughts, comments, questions you have down below. Um, let us know what additional topics you'd like us to cover. Subscribe, hit the bell button, follow along, all that good stuff. We appreciate you all. Stay well, keep learning, and we will see you next time.